Hello and welcome to Ethically Speaking, the UCF interdisciplinary series on contemporary moral issues. My name is Steve Kubler and I'm the organizer of this series and I'm professor of chemistry and optics and founding associate director of the Center for Ethics at the University of Central Florida. In today's event, Dr. Justin Hess will guide us through a discussion of what role empathy plays in engineering. We'll talk about how engineers could be trained so that empathy helps guide them toward ethical decisions. Before we introduce Dr. Hess, I'd like to say a few words about our speaker series and how you can participate. So Ethically Speaking is organized by the UCF Center uh, for Ethics with my collaborator, Dr. Jonathan Bieber, who's Associate Professor of Ethics and Digital Culture and Founding Director of the Center for Ethics. We developed Ethically Speaking to promote conversations about challenging issues of our time. We encourage you to visit the center's website at ethicscenter.research.ucf.edu to learn more about our activities and to find out about other speakers in our series. We'd also like to hear your feedback and your ideas for future talks in Ethically Speaking. Ethics connects to every facet of our professional and personal lives. And the importance of ethics at UCF, I think is clear from the long list of inaugural partners you see on this slide who helped launch our series. All of us in this partnership hope you enjoy discussions in Ethically Speaking, and we hope it cultivates understanding of how ethics provides frameworks for making better decisions, particularly when there are competing values. Today's presentation is being recorded, and we'll post a link to the recording on the Center for Ethics website so you can view it again and share it with others. And at the end of the presentation, Dr. Hess will take questions moderated by Dr. Beaver. You can submit your questions during the talk directly to Dr. Beaver via chat. And I'm now going to stop the screen share here and turn things over to Dr. Beaver, who will introduce our speaker. Dr. Beaver? Thanks, Dr. Kubler. It's my pleasure to welcome my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Justin Hess. Um, Dr. Hess is an assistant professor in the School of Engineering Education at Purdue University, and where he did his uh, MS and BS in civil engineering as well. Um, he's held positions at IUPUI, which is Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, as the assistant director of their STEM Education Innovation and Research Institute, and as a graduate student was a former GRFP recipient. He serves in two key service roles currently, and Dr. Hess, you can correct me if I'm missing any, but at least as editorial board chair for the Online Ethics Center, the, um, the country's preeminent um, center for uh, um, online education resources, and as the deputy director for, of research for Purdue's National Institute of Engineering Ethics, which launched just a couple of years ago. Importantly to me, Dr. Hess has quickly emerged as a national leader in researching how empathy shapes the engineering landscape. He and his lab are widely cited for wor their work in that space. I'm really grateful to Justin for sharing his time with us this morning, and we'll turn things over to him. Um, all right, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Kubler, Dr. Beaver, um, for the warm welcome. Um, today we're talking about empathy, and I, I was assured, right, um, we're not all philosophers, and I think the name of the series, right, is is interdisciplinary, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to an interdisciplinary group, and I'm especially excited for uh, the critical feedback as we go, philosopher or not. Um, we actually are going to start today with an activity, um, so if you want to join, and do you see my screen okay? I'm actually not going to screen share quite yet. Um, so the name of the talk is How Does Empathy Inform Ethics in Engineering? And I made a slight revision um, to add in the parentheticals, or how can, because um, I'm not suggesting that I have all the answers that um, I'm sharing in the talk, nor that there's a single way to promote empathy. Um, as we'll highlight throughout the talk, empathy is a really complex phenomenon. As for the activity, um, so I'll start with a reflection question. I'll give you a minute. Um, consider someone you know and love. What are they doing right now? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? We're going to build on this activity in the next slide. But we have a word for everything we just did, the thing that we all just did. And what is that word? Anyone shout it out. I'm going with empathy. And I, I, I want to say sympathy. Sympathy, great. Um, 
first of all, there's tensions, right? Tensions is going to feature into the talk. And there's a study, I don't even know if I cited it, by Cuff, um, Cuff and colleagues, 2016, that talks about tensions and empathy. And, and one of the tensions is, is, is this thing called empathy or is it something else, some other phenomenon? Empathy versus sympathy um, are often um, framed as distinct phenomenon. Um, so here, you know, if we all reflect on this question, consider someone you know and love. What are they doing right now? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? I only gave you about 20, 30 seconds. First of all, could everyone do it? See some head nods. Was there anything surprisingly easy or difficult about that reflection? Anyone? They were doing was easier than what they're feeling and um, uh, how what they're thinking. You said understanding what they were feeling was easier than what they were thinking. Do I have that right? No, doing what they were doing what is easiest. Doing. Yeah, I see. The behavior. Um, that's interesting. Um, what do you think made it so, so the second question is to what extent could you actually consider the thoughts and feelings of the individual? So it's harder to do that. So what do you think made that harder? I found that my own feelings got in the way. Um, it's hard to feel somebody else without feeling what you feel for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. We have feelings. I think that's important. And that's another theme we'll, we'll talk about through the talk, uh, knowing thyself. I think is key and to not lose sight of yourself, right? Um, that's another takeaway that I'll, I'll hope to deliver throughout the talk. Um, and sometimes ourselves can make it harder for different reasons. For Jonathan, it's it's the feelings that you have right now. And, and perhaps might I infer like the alignment or per potential misalignment with others' feelings? Something in that space, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right for me. Like when I think of when I think of that tension you're talking about, Justin, I always think like sympathy is is my feelings for somebody else and empathy is my feeling someone else's feelings and those two mm -hmm. things are so readily conflated that it's hard to pull them apart for me anyway mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you for adding that and i uh, just going to the chat um Mac macau if i'm saying that right please correct me if not um shared we can only gauge feelings based on external questions um, do I read that like there's there's a requirement for maybe some type of interaction? Am I reading that correctly? Yes. Yeah. I, I appreciate that point um, because for me, I separate empathy from things like interaction, like communication. I think they're intimately connected. And for accuracy, right, the em empathic accuracy is another term you might see draws attention to how accurate our, our understanding of others' thoughts and feelings is. And there are ways to boost that accuracy, such as interaction, right? That seems really obvious. Um, perhaps the individuals you, you know, I asked you to reflect on, maybe you've communicated with them recently. No one quite shared that, but I would suspect that that probably made it easier to answer this question. Or perhaps it's your kids, your spouse, your parents, someone you live with, Right, maybe you've seen them this morning, right? So I agree. Um, you know, better yet, if you've actually communicated with them and they've given you feedback, sure, the accuracy is probably going to go up. Um, and I think this builds on uh, Lickland's comment that sometimes it's hard to know what people feel without asking about them about it. Um, so sometimes you'll see, and I'll, I'll talk very briefly about empathic behaviors. That's something I separate from empathy. I consider the empathic behavior as a product of other types of empathy, which we're going to go through what that means. Um, but for some people, right, some people study what we call empathic behavior, such as empathic communication. That's a really prominent one from um, really two, a, a group of thought leaders in our field, um, le led by Joe Walther, Nikki Sahachka, and, and Sherry Miller. Um, on developing a model of empathy and engineering. So thank you for embracing the activity. It's the start of Thursday morning, busy time of the semester. I'll, I'll go ahead and formally dive into the slides and, and thank you for bearing with me as we deliver some of the key points right out of the gate. So here are the three takeaways I hope people will leave this talk with today. Um, 
and perhaps there's more, but the three that I try to emphasize through the talk. So the first is that empathy can promote ethical reasoning and motivate pro-social behavior in engineering. Um, so it can promote what, what, what I call engineering ethics. Um, the second is empathy is a complex multidimensional phenomenon. There's competing operationalizations and understandings, which gets back to this idea of tensions. Um, and finally, I argue that engineers need a heuristic that they can use to empathize with and for stakeholders, starting with the self, but to folks across the globe. I don't think I have a slide on this, but in engineering, right, we're, as an instructor, or if we're, we have an engineering program, we're required to help engineers think about global impacts of their work or global considerations. You know, if I argue empathy is key to ethical reasoning, I think we need strategies to help folks consider thoroughly and authentically consider um, stakeholders across the globe. So that's the goal, that's the compass of this talk. So I wanna start with some motivation. Um, so I have a number of colleagues who have, have motivated me into the space of engineering education to start. So the top row is folks I, I worked with very early in my career, uh, including our very own Jonathan Beaver. Um, you know, in the bottom row is, is my current lab. And I know Aris has joined us today. Ms. camera's on. Welcome, Aris. Some of whom have studied empathy explicitly, including Aris, a, a recent doctor, recently defended his uh, dissertation. Um, and I'll give a nod to uh, your dissertation later, Aris. Um, but he studied this thing called collective empathy. Um, and in addition to empathy, as we traditionally describe it, and try to explore how empathy informed team um, team processes in engineering. So he's the expert on that. He's here on the call. If you have questions, chat at Aris. Um, well. So uh, Johanna Strobel pictured here was um, a co-advisor and I did undergraduate research with Johannes. He encouraged me to pursue grad school, including engineering education. Um, it really wasn't my plan to pass away, um, but during undergraduate research, I found a passion as well as an understanding of this thing called engineering education, um, which if folks don't know, right, we have a school of engineering education at Purdue. It's a discipline in itself and it's, it's grown a lot over the last 20 or so years. Um, in 2011, uh, Johannes and team did a what I would call something like a scoping review. Um, I'm sorry, a systematic review here. I'll, I'll reference the scoping review in a second of studies on empathy and care in engineering and engineering education. Um, and what they, for inclusion criteria, they only retained articles that define these terms or clearly focused on them, like more than you know, just minimal, just an off mention of the terms. Um, and so what they found is that there are 16 articles that have a concerted focus on empathy in the areas of engineering education, management, ethics, um, and professional development. And likewise, 16 articles with a concerted focus on care, including again, engineering education and ethics, but here also engineering design and computer engineering. Um, you know, since that time, um, around 2011, right, we started to see an exponential rise in research on empathy in engineering. So ASCE. Empathy, but I would imagine you would see a similar rise, right, in papers. Um, you know, we haven't done this analysis for the, for these papers, but I, I can tell you one of the primary areas dipping my toes in the literature is in design. Um, and maybe this isn't surprising, um, but for folks who don't know, um, in a lot of design methodologies, such as offered by D School and IDEO, you know, two leading schools of thought, um, empathize has often become the first step in the design process. Like you empathize first, and then you carry forth throughout the rest of the design process. So I think that has a lot to do with this rise as well. Um, but also I think the space of ethics, which again is the focus of the talk today. Um, this is part of my dissertation work. Um, and so in the study, I, I interviewed practicing engineers about their views of how empathy manifested in their practice or the role it played. 
Um, and so this model, this functional model that we developed through interviews with engineers suggested that there are three prominent categories of um, outcomes of empathizing, be they intrapersonal, so helping engineers understand others better, for example, interpersonal, such as building trusting relationships, be those internal within the company or perhaps with customers, clients, stakeholders. Um, and then finally, just improving the outcomes of the engineering products or, or works themselves, um, such as making sure we develop things that meet the needs of users, because if we're not doing that, then what are we doing? Um, building on that in a thought piece with Nick Fila in what I would call a scoping review, um, which just differentiates it from a systematic review, which is its own methodology with a series of procedures um, to extract data. Um, scoping review rather purposeful based on our observations of literature we put together. Um, these five areas for embedding empathy in engineering programs. Um, so the areas include design thinking and ethics education, which I've referred to already, as well as community engagement or what might be called service learning. Um, and then communication, you know, so like presentations like this, right? Communicating with your audience, as well as collaboration. So working with team members. And I've already given a shout out to Aris. Um, I, one of the things we encourage people to do is, is to carry these areas further and focus on empathy in those domains. Um, so Aris's work, right, focused on collaboration, but also in a design thinking context. Um, so of course the areas overlap, right? Um, For the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus on the area of ethics. And a lot of my dissertation work and my work today continues to be motivated by Martin Hoffman. Um, and in this book, um, entitled Empathy and Moral Development, Impl Implications for Caring and Justice, um, he, he talks about empathy and its role in both care and justice as, as ethical principles. We're going to carry those forward throughout the later parts of the talk. Um, but he has a quote that, that I often like to use, um, that empathy is the spark of human concern for others, and it's the glue that makes social life possible. Um, so going back to some of our earlier comments, right, empathy can both serve to motivate helping behavior, motivate interactions with others, right? There's also kind of a, a, um, a looping effect, if you will, right? Because those interactions can also inform empathy, vice versa, um, in an ongoing cycle. Um, also, I just want to offer that empathy is a piece to the puzzle of engineering ethics. Again, it's not the whole puzzle, but I think it's a pretty important piece, given its role in ethical reasoning and also promoting behavior. Um, before kind of diving into empathy and what it means, I just want to briefly go over this idea of micro and macro ethics. Um, this is a pretty popular framing in engineering ethics today, in large thanks, thanks to Joe Herkert in his 2005 work here, um, which, you know, as Dr. Herkert will say, like he didn't create this uh, distinction, this framing. In fact, he borrowed it from Jonathan Ladd. And so if you check out that work, he will point you in that direction as well. Um, I'm gonna go over this in briefly, in brief. Um, I really like this quote from Dr. Herkert's work. Um, and as he describes, engineering ethics can be viewed from three frames of references individual, professional, and social, which in turn can be divided into microethics, which is concerned with ethical decision-making by individual engineers, as well as the engineering profession's internal relationships. So thinking of the profession as a whole. Um, and macroethics, on the other hand, refers to the profession's collective social responsibility, as well as the so uh, societal decisions about technology we make, and in turns the impact that that uh, technology has. So I mentioned tensions out of the gate. So first of all, I know dichotomies can be problematic, but they can also be pra pragmatically useful. Um, so I used Rather, I, I might think of them as frames that we can actually shift between. They offer useful questions for us to consider and interrogate, in this case, engineering problems in different ways. Um, building on this idea, right, um, I'll, I'll carry this forward as we go, but 
Um, microethics, again, focuses on individual and, and interpersonal aspects of professionalism, um, relationships with others, um, especially others within the profession per Herkert. Um, but I would argue that any interpersonal encounters kind of factor in here where the engineer is asking, what ought I do, right? Um, this has historically been a common feature or focus of engineering education. Although in recent years, I've seen literature saying there's a marked shift actually to macroethics. So, or maybe there's um, relative parity today. Um, conversely, macroethics focuses again on the collective social responsibilities of a profession, such as engineering. Um, I also argue that it's challenging, right? Um, and I'll, I'll go over this just in a little more detail next. But despite its challenge to think of systemic issues, cause and effects, you know, that's what we train engineers to think about. Um, it's, it's being increasingly recognized in engineering and engineering education. Um, so building from Lakoff, as cited in Alice Polly's 2019 JE editorial, um, <clears throat> Lakoff states, we're accustomed to think about ethics and engineering, but may, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but mainly in terms of individual accountability or microethics i.e. not direct or direct, i.e. not systemic causality, right? So what ought I do in this situation? Uh, Macroethics is really complicated. So I have a bunch of gears, right? Turning the other gears uh, and the picture on the left, right? That's a really complicated picture. And that's actually probably more simplistic, um, you know, cause gears, right? Interact in, in ways that we can kind of control. Um, in, th in terms of macroethics, right? Again, people are very good at understanding direct causation, but less good at thinking about systemic causation. Um, so thinking about the world we live in, how the technologies we create, for example, might have long-term outcomes on stakeholders that, that maybe we just have to imagine, right? And maybe we can't do that very accurately. It's kind of a takeaway of the heuristic we'll get at the end, even though we might never not be able to do it completely accurately. I don't think that gets us off the hook for trying right, to do it. But you can imagine macroethics in its fullest sense might be thinking about stakeholders on the other side of the world in 100 years, right? And all of a sudden, that's very, very hard. And how does the decision I make as an engineer might have a downstream effect on that group or that stakeholder? But again, I think the framings are, are useful because they, ask, uh, they lead, lead us to ask different types of questions. So if we think about professional responsibility in microethics or as a, a starting point, because remember Herkert said there's three frames, professional being one of them, um, a microethicist might ask what I, what I do as an individual or a professional engineer in this situation. A macroethicist on the other hand may ask what ought we do as an engineering profession, right? Or as an engineering organization to resolve this ethical issue. What are our collective responsibilities, right? That becomes the framing. In the context of how others are impacted by engineering decisions, a microethicist might ask, how does what I say or do affect another? Um, whereas a macroethicist may rather ask, how does what I say and do impact groups, communities, regions, nations, the earth? Right, so there, there are different types of questions. And I, I make the claim, um, the empathy can motivate engineers to address these questions and in ways that center stakeholders, right? And I'll, I'll have a limitation slide. I think there's a lot of work in going into selecting the stakeholders, which this talk does not focus on. There's a lot of equity considerations wrapped up in this idea. Um, nonetheless, how empathy manifests may vary based on whether the engineer considers microethical or macroethical questions such as this, those here. So I think it's an important, it behooves us to better understand how empathy manifests in distinct ways to support ethical reasoning interaction. So next we'll unpack this, this complicated phenomenon called empathy. So first of all, there's numerous ways to operationalize empathy. Um, here I present ways that resonate with me and I emphasize what I call two empathy dimensions, cognitive and affective empathy. Um, so Daniel C. Batson um, has a 2009 study that I love, love to cite because I think it presents um, this idea with clarity of, around what empathy is. It answers that question with a lot of clarity, at least to me. Um, 
And he starts this work by suggesting that two questions guide research on empathy. Um, so the first is, how can one know what another person is thinking and feeling? Which is pretty similar to the opening question I asked you all, right, to engage in. This is essentially what I asked you to do. Uh, the second is, what leads one person to respond with sensitivity and care to the suffering of another? Now, I've mentioned for me, empathy motivates action, right? It's not the action itself. And I think in Batson's review of, of literature, um, he puts forth that there are eight distinct types of empathy that are generated in response to these questions. Um, so I'm not going to go through the whole list, but starting from the top, he talks about what I refer to as empathic accuracy, which involves knowing another person's internal state, including their thoughts or feelings. Right. This has to do with the accuracy, again, like in our opening question of how well you know their states, um, which, you know, we heard, right, maybe what they're doing is something you can directly observe. And sure, that's probably easier to infer, right? If I pick up this pen, you can probably be pretty sure I'm picking up this pen, but inferring my thoughts and feelings might be a little harder. Um, going down to the end, um, since Jonathan used the word sympathy, um, Batson describes empathic concern as feeling for another person who is suffering. Um, I personally think empathic concern is very similar to this idea of sympathy. I still think this is, a, per Batson's framing here, a type of empathy, but some would say no, right? This idea of feeling for is different. And so I'm gonna offer a model here in just a minute that I hope will clarify these types. And it, it builds on this idea that most of these types are primarily affective or cognitive in nature. And so, first of all, you know, I, I read this term recently that this is a phenomenological distinction. That means it's not real. Like, it, it's useful, we made it up. Why do I say that? Well, cognition, right? My brain is part of my body, right? Affective just draws attention to the whole bodily experience, whereas cognitive draws attention to things going on in the brain, right? The thoughts and feelings, the thoughts that we have, or maybe even the thoughts about feelings. Um, I would further argue that some of these are, are primarily self-oriented about me, or for you, they're about you, um, or other-oriented, where it's an emphasis on another person. So the distinction being an emphasis on oneself versus others. And so if you take these and put them on a two-by-two two axis, um, I, I would further argue, and so Nick and I, Nick Phila and I worked on this model that, that's expanded over time, but the starting point had the two axes, um, where self versus em empathy, right? Again, thinking of tensions, um, it vacillates between self-oriented, other-oriented, and affective experiences, cognitive processes. Um, and the idea is that these concepts would fit in different dimensions. But I think over time, I, I've realized the importance of just emphasizing the quadrants themselves. And I think it's useful to kind of go through these. And the shorthand, I think, um, is, is helpful as well. So in this framing, um, if you start with the bottom left, self-oriented cognitive empathy might be thought of as thinking as, um, whereas other-oriented cognitive empathy involves thinking of. And I like to think of the, we, I haven't heard anyone say putting yourself on someone else's shoes quite yet, but often when you hear the term empathy, um, that's the colloquial term or phrase we use. Empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Uh, these two dimensions just draw attention to the distinction between putting your, yourself in someone else's shoes versus imagining someone else in their own shoes. And the idea is that those are two distinct things, right? So if I use Jonathan as an example, me imagining myself experiencing Jonathan's, you know, I don't know, total eclipse research, right? Would be very different than me trying to imagine Jonathan engaging in that work. We had, we had a little conversation before we started. Jonathan's doing some cool, cool research that maybe will, I don't know, message him. Uh, if you want more details about that. But the idea is simply, right, if I just imagine Jonathan going and collecting that data, right, that would be very different than if I was imagining myself making the trip, going to Hawaii, Ohio, uh, et cetera. And, and first of all, both of these are on the cognitive processes side. And processes, I'm trying to draw attention to things that are going on in the brain. Um, affective, on the affective experiences, other oriented side, in the top right, we have what I, I might refer to as feeling for another. This is where empathic concern would fit. Um, and this can be contrasted with feeling with another. Um, 
So the distinction here being maybe others have feelings and there's an outward feeling towards another. Feeling with it involves the internalization of some of those feelings or perhaps an impulse to act based on those feelings. So while, while imperfect, right, this is parsimonious, um, but I think it's useful. A lot of folks have reduced focus, foci on empathy to, to what might be referred to as two dimensions. So lumping the affective together, calling this affective empathy and lumping the cognitive together and calling this cognitive empathy. And I think there is some merit to this, right? So even to use the example of thinking as and thinking of in the shoes, right? Jonathan in the shoes versus me. Usually there's some rapid feedback between those two, right? To really understand Jonathan and in his shoes, I really have to think of myself and what I know, right? And go, it's a, a back and forth. Um, similarly, on the affective side, you know, part of my research tries to measure these by teasing them apart. And this has been really hard to tease apart, right? How the feeling for versus feeling with, because these things can be so rapid. Um, I've referred to behavioral empathy. Um, so the way I think of behavioral empathy is something that builds on affective and cognitive empathy. They support what we might call an empathic behavior. Um, and this borrows from the work from Clark et al, who has an organizational study on, on empathy a study on how organizations have measured and researched empathy. Um, and they argue in that work that there's three primary dimensions that folks have studied, um, be they affective, cognitive, or in this case, behavioral. And as they describe, state behavioral empathy is engaging in verbal and nonverbal behaviors um, that demonstrate affective or cognitive empathy, right? It builds on these things. So I get really excited about talking about empathy. I, I think in this context, it's really useful before we go forward and try to understand um, how, how does empathy relate to engineering ethics? Um, there's a fifth part where I offer a heuristic, but before we even get there, I think it's maybe helpful to think about this idea of moral development. So people becoming more moral um, and what that might mean. So there's a lot of frameworks of moral development. Um, I'm going to build into into this talk. And one thing I also again want to say is I, I can kind of consider these as branches of a tree, right? Distinct branches, maybe competing in a sense, um, but it's not this or that again. Um, and so first I describe Carol Gilligan's framework, which has an emphasis on relationships. Uh, and Lawrence Kohlberg's framework, which has an emphasis on reasoning. I'm going to go over those and I'm going to bring back um, the tensions that I described earlier. I think if you place this on the micro macro, um, I argue that care largely aligns with microethics, but not exclusively, right? I mean, these are intention. Um, I think care, as exhibited in um, Carol Gilligan's moral development framework in particular, largely aligns with what I, I refer to as microethics. Conversely, macroethics largely, but again, not exclusively aligns closely with justice-based moral development frameworks, particularly Lawrence Kohlberg's, um, which I'll go over those here in brief. So this, um, first of all, there's similarities between Carol Gilligan's framework and Kohlberg's. Um, each of these has a sequence of develop, developmental stages, which increase in terms of comprehensiveness. The idea is that you go through these stages, whether it's an invariant sequence or you can shift between them. Um, that's, a, that's a topic of conversation and research. Um, and I, I can say more about that if we have questions. Um, but the idea is that moral development uh, um, starts with what we might refer to as a pre-conventional stage. And both Kill Carol Gilligan and Lawrence Kohlberg use this framing. Um, for uh, Dr. Gilligan, the idea is um, uh, the goal, or as they describe it, it's about survival. Um, and survival is correlated with, and in each of these frameworks, there's this perspective taking tendency, which is, is in the cognitive empathy domain. Um, and here in this first pre-conventional stage, uh, it's largely ego egocentric. So in this model, um, there's an initial focus on caring for the self. Right, so care is still here, but it's about caring for the self in order to ensure survival. Um, but this is followed by a transitional fa phase where this is eventually realized or perceived to be selfish, um, which signals this new understanding of the connection between self and others. Um, the idea of responsibility 
comes in here. But the description here, as we have it, is caring for others. Um, so good, thinking of the moral good, right? This is equated with caring for others. Um, but there's an exclusion of the self, right? Um, so this gives, again, rise to problems, which leads to, can lead to a transition to the third um, stage or perspective, which here focuses on the dynamics of relationships. Um, it dissipates the tension between selfishness and responsibility. Um, through a new understanding of the interconnection uh, between other and self. So here care remains an emphasis. It becomes, um, to cite Gilligan, it becomes the self-chosen principle of a judgment that remains psychological in its concern with relationships and response, but it becomes universal in its condemnation of exploitation and hurt. Here's the takeaway I offer thinking about this model. So a more comprehensive one's ethic of care is, the more likely they are to develop caring, understanding, and compassionate relationships between self and others, right? That involve caring for the self and others and also the relationship between the two. So if we turn to Kohlberg, right, we see a, a similar pattern in terms of the stage sequence. There are three levels, again, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. But each of these levels has um, two stages. Um, but the pathway is similar, right? As we move from pre to post, we're, our, our level of moral development is becoming more comprehensive. So stages one and two I've lumped together here. Um, in terms of the social perspective taking tendency are, are described as egocentric. Again, like, like Gilligan's, um, the individual emphasizes self-interest, um, which transitions into what Kohlberg calls concrete individualistic. Um, here, the individual understands others have their own self-interests, but they view right as relative. So what is right? It's a relative um, phenomenon. And the conventional stage includes, again, two stages. The conventional level includes two stages, good intentions and obedience to authority. So again, talking through the social perspective taking tendency um, here um, at the good intentions stage, this involves um, considering perspectives of the individual in, in relationships with other individuals. So in a way, this sounds a lot like Carol Gilligan's final stage, right? For Kohlberg, he, he continues emphasizing, uh, he, he goes beyond this and emphasizes um, a societal and systems perspectives, which begins to differentiate a societal point of view um, from interpersonal agreement or motives. Um, which paves the way to the final two stages, which Kohlberg describes as moral versus legal, followed by principle-based. Um, so in the fifth stage, um, what Kohlberg calls a prior to society perspective, um, he describes as um, the perspective where an individual thinks of the perspective of a rational individual, aware of values and rights, but prior to social attachments, right? Before everything that comes with, you know, being part of the US, I'm a US citizen, or right, name your religion, et cetera, right? Finally, at the principle advice stage um, here, the individual um, recognizes the nature of morality and that persons are ends in themselves and must be treated as such. Um, for Kohlberg, justice was the guiding principle, although over his career, he kind of loosened this to any principle, right? Um, but throughout his career, justice was that key principle. But the takeaway here is that principles, right? We're moving towards a principle-based types of reasoning that are largely a macroethical in nature, right? So we can see this increasingly emphasis on, on the macro level, the systems perspectives, even the prior to society perspective. So building on this and the tensions framing, I argue that the affect, affective empathy in particular um, could be situated within micro macro or, or alongside micro macro microethics and, and the care-based moral development framework. Again, not exclusively. And we're going to go over this a little more. Um, on the other side, cognitive empathy, I argue more closely aligns with microethics and justice-based frameworks, particularly where we have to try, right? We have to try to consider those perspectives of folks, again, who maybe be on the other part of the world, or maybe that are 100 years right down the line, 21 whatever year that would be, 21, 24, right? That's not to say, right? Again, if I imagine a stakeholder in 21, 24, like that takes a lot of cognitive power. That doesn't mean I, I can't care, right? There's a tension here, but the primary framing of considering those stakeholders is largely cognitive. 
and nature. And this, this builds into this idea. Not only do they go together, but they should, right? Cognitive empathy then can inform affective empathy and vice versa. And I think this is really apparent in, in Martin Hoffman's model, where for him, empathic distress, which is um, if we go back to the two by two grid I showed, um, is a self-oriented affective empathy type. For him, this was key to promoting pro-social behavior. The idea that we have to internalize something, we have to feel with another, and we have to feel in su to such an extent that it motivates action. And, and Martin Hoffman used the term empathic distress. Um, that's negatively worded, right? I imagine we could have empathic joy that maybe sparks an action as well, but using um, Martin Hoffman's framing, empathic distress was the key to pro-social behavior and it could be influenced by you know, cognitive empathy, sympathy, if you wanna differentiate that. Um, but moreover, we needed a certain, we need a certain level of empathic distress. Um, so within a certain range, right, there's a higher probability of us helping. So here on the far left end, not enough empathic distress, we won't do anything. There's kind of a threshold where it's a sufficient level where we'll do something to help the other, whether that be to alleviate our suffering or our distress or some other reason, right? Then there's another threshold where too much distress leads to not helping, right? All of a sudden we, we feel so much distress, we, we focus again inward perhaps. Um, and so Hoffman gives, um, oh gosh, I like to give the example, it might come from Hoffman, it might come from uh, Franz DeWall, but like think about if someone close to you had recently passed and a friend or colleague is talking about someone who has a similar relationship to them had passed, it's very likely, it's very possible like that you might focus inward because you still have those feelings. They're still really pertinent at that point. Maybe they always will be. Um, so your focus shifts to yourself. So in shorthand, right, with insufficient empathic distress, you might avoid the other, right? The optimal threshold or the optimal range here in the middle, you'll help the other. And then what Hoffman calls empathic arousal, we might instead focus on ourselves. I, I showed this before getting to the next heuristic because I do think like as we imagine against stakeholders a hundred years down the road, and I teach engineers, right? It might not be enough, right? Just imagining might not be enough to actually do something. I think that's a key limitation of the model I'll show here in part five. Nonetheless, I don't think that means we shouldn't try. Um, so the heuristic is here for promoting empathy, specifically among engineers, although I think it could be useful beyond engineering, um, from the self to across the globe. So three key points here. Um, First, empathy can manifest in distinct ways in engineering, right, specifically. So when we look at empathy in engineering, it might actually look different than other professions. So that's um, supported by 2013 paper, um, you know, with Johannes, uh, Celia Pan, and Carrie Walker Morris, um, where we interviewed engineers, uh, engineering faculty, um, you know, and suggested like the social nature of engineering might lend engineers to, to focus on social groups. Um, and, and for those who don't know, in engineering, not only are we required to teach towards the global considerations, we're also help, supposed to help engineers consider the social uh, in their work. Um, and that pans out with empathy. And there's a phenomenon, I should have cited it by um, Seagal, called social empathy, right? This is a phenomenon or a topic that's been increasingly studied even outside of engineering. But within engineering, um, we see this focus on, on groups. Um, while engineers make decisions that impact stakeholders across the globe, it's, it's not possible to hear all the voices that are affected by engineering decisions, um, especially like if we add the time dimension, right? Thinking about stakeholders before us even um, and those after us. I, here again, this is repeating, but perspective taking, which, which is a type of cognitive empathy. Um, enables one to imagine the needs, perspectives, and impact of engineering choices on ing individuals who are far away. Um, and we made an, a line of argumentation in, in the chapter, Jonathan and I, around in 2017. So I'm happy to share that reference if you're interested. And in, in that paper, we really focus specifically on the relationship between perspective taking and ethical reasoning and engineering. We really zeroed in on that topic. Um, so I'm gonna show you a model in a, in a minute, and there's a couple frames of reference in the model. 
before I get there, I want to do another activity. I uh, hope I haven't lost anyone. Um, you can report out or not, or just type in as we go. But here's the challenge, um, the task. So imagine a four-person team, perhaps one that you're recently that you're working on right now, or that you recently worked on. Um, speak of your team members, including yourself. And if it's helpful, write them down so you don't lose them. Um, type them in your computer, make them handy, or just keep them um, right there at top of mind. Okay, so now I want you to, to imagine empathizing with a teammate who we might call peer one. Take a minute, you can imagine the situation if this particular situation and time is helpful because context matters, right? Um, I'll pause just for a minute, right? This idea of empathy between two individuals is, is how empathy is often bit studied, right? This is empathy research if you go back, you know, you know, decades, uh, not given the history of empathy, but as a term, right? It's been around for at least a, around 100 years. Although fun fact, Adam Smith is often credited um, for first discussing empathy, albeit using the term sympathy in his book, Theory of Moral Sentiments. Um, going back to the sympathy tension, Jonathan discussed, or the term, um, digression, apologies. But I do think that's an important point, again, before we get to this graphic, but okay. So I hope you all had a chance to imagine Pure One. I'm gonna shift, and I'm gonna ask you to imagine empathizing with another teammate, Pure Three team member three. Not gonna have people report out for time. Just gonna keep going. Now imagine empathizing with teammates one and three at the same time. I see, see at least one head nod. See some puzzled expressions. Could, could we do it? Maybe it's gotten a little hazy, but I see a head nod. Okay, I see some head nods. All right, now imagine all three because we, we hadn't had peer two in the equation yet. Can you do this? Maybe. Peer one and three was hard. Maybe peers one, three, and two are hard too. And it probably entirely depends on your team. So I, I've reduced some slides here, right? Because the arrows were one way versus back and forth, right? And this this graphic builds that out to the idea that empathy is two-way. It should be a two-way phenomenon, right? Empathy is something that you might have for someone and they in turn can empathize with you. Um, so again, shout out to Aris, right? We, we worked together on this topic that we called Building from Acune, um, Collective Empathy, which you might see elsewhere referred to as group empathy. But I think the idea of the collective is trying to think about all of the people involved in the equation. And I think Akin studied it in team context, as did Aris in his uh, dissertation work, which, which builds on this 2021 paper. Um, the idea is that, right, you can empathize with the group, but the reason of doing the activity is that it gets really muddy really quick, right? And so Aris and I asked a lot of questions like, well, what happens if you're empathizing with peer one and three, but not two, or two seems to be out of the equation, right? Is that still collective empathy? But the idea is that everyone's kind of on the same page. There's a shared team perspective that kind of crystallizes over time, and that becomes the action or the object of empathy. But it's it's kind of a constellation or a accumulation of the thoughts and the feelings and the perspectives throughout the team. Um, I think affective empathy plays a prominent role here too, especially if you think of reactions with teams where you, you see each other in person, right? Um, affective empathy is often very automatic, right? You see someone smile, you might smile, right? So if you had any team members who are having a bad day, right? You could probably see that and you get that feedback pretty quickly. Um, that goes away with, with the next three, well, with some of the frames of reference I'll show in heuristic in, in just a minute. And just a reminder, right? Engineers are often tasked, not often, they are. In engineering pro programs, you're required to teach engineers to think about global impacts and issues. 
So if we accept empathy as critical for ethical reasoning, all right, the following slides provide a heuristic to help understand how engineers might or can engage with user perspectives or stakeholder perspectives via empathy and at very various levels of impact. Um, so this is empathy across six frames of references. I, I, I added one recently. Um, so apologies for the typo, there's six. Um, and this borrows in part from uh, Charles Perrault's book, Normal Accidents, um, particularly frames of reference three through four. Um, he uses a victim classification scheme for thinking about systemic technological issues and, and who's impacted by those. And as, he, as quoted here, so looking at frames of reference three through six, which build again from Perrault, as he describes, first party victims are the operators Second party victims are non-operating personnel or system users such as passengers on a ship. Third party victims are innocent bystanders. Um, so the people who are impacted but maybe didn't have a say. Then four, fourth party victims for him are fetuses and future generations. Um, and as we move from operators to future generations, the number of persons, you know, very human centric here, but involved rises geometrically. So building out the frames of reference, again, empathy starts with the self. And actually, there's actually research that shows if you lose sight of your self perspective when engaging in other oriented perspective taking, considering someone else in their own shoes, i.e. when one blurs the self other boundary, the accuracy actually declines. Right? So if I'm empathizing with Jonathan and trying to imagine himself in his shoes, but really I'm just imagining myself, I'm probably not gonna do a good job of understanding Jonathan in his shoes. But understanding, like, I have to work from my perspective because it's what I know or what, I don't know, this is perhaps meta, what I think I know. Again, collective empathy, right, focuses on empathy between all individuals in a group. Um, so I, I term this in terms of one-to-one -one or team level. And so especially through direct interaction, if you have a good team, I mean, you probably interact frequently. I mean, it depends on the team. Lots of variation, of course. But affective empathy can here can be automatic, right? It can activate the consideration of others' perspectives or even responses to their needs. Um, again, the frames three through six are borrowing but adapted from Paro. So the first is the operators from systems. The second is passengers or participants within systems. And then the third is innocent bystanders, right? So these three, I, I've left largely the same, although I will say a fun fact. So while Perot talks about innocent bystanders, this is actually a key term in Martin Hoffman's book as well. A lot of uh, what he's studying is like, what does an in innocent bystander do when they see someone being harmed, for example, but they're not the person causing the harm. Um, and then finally, past and future generations. So here I've added the past. I like to do this activity with my students. I, I think we have some responsibility to consider the perspectives of those before us. And I think, moreover, those perspectives inform where we are today, right? So historical unfoldings. So I don't think they should be lost, right? And also I'll add, right, this is intentionally not human centric. I think innocent bystanders can indeed and should be animals. And that's, I mean, humans are animals, right? Non-human animals or life. Same as past and future generations. And who knows, maybe even operators or passengers within the systems could be too. So here's a heuristic. I've done a lot of build up to it because I think it's all important before showing it. But again, the goal is thinking from the self to global. And so as we move between those two, stakeholders move from homogeneous to heterogeneous, more diverse in nature, right? Near the engineer to far away and then individual to global. Likewise, ethical issues move from micro to macro in nature. And I would argue empathy also shifts from largely affective to cognitive primacy, right? That's the primary mode of um, empathy's manifestation. So thinking about the six frames of reference, um, you can see these kind of, they're expanding in terms of scope, in terms of the number of stakeholders. And we move from self the team level to the operators, the systems, passengers, bystanders, and the past and future generations also offer the key before showing everything in the middle. The key, like there's a number of individual stakeholders at each level. Um, what I argue is that this could be used to think about proxy stakeholders at each level. So those small bubbles represent what I call proxy stakeholders. 
The large bubbles in turn represent what I would call stakeholder groups. Um, and there's not time to go through all of this, but even each of those ideas, I think, could have their own talk on them. So how do you define a proxy stakeholder? Who is the effect effectively an objectively good proxy stakeholder? And in turn, also, what are the groups that we should consider? I mean, those are serious questions. I'm not answering those here. But what I am suggesting is that at each of these frames of references, there's an increasingly large number of stakeholders represented by the little dots. Um, an increasing number of proxy stakeholders, um, but not infinite. So the proxy stakeholders are manageable to direct our empathy. And, and similarly, in, in alignment, there's um, a similar number of stakeholder groups, right? The groups that we can consider to empathize, right? So the goal of empathizing with every single individual past and future generations is, is just not feasible. Part of this is trying to make it manageable by thinking about those proxies who can effectively help us make inferences for a group. Um, so proxy stakeholders is key to the model. It involves answering the question, you know, how can I effectively understand the needs or perspectives of a group? You know, empathy is key to doing this, right? And the proxy stakeholders, I think they can include literal stakeholders. Um, and I give the example of like, if the US is in war, the president of the United States becomes the commander in chief. Maybe that's your proxy stakeholder for the nation, the United States, right? This, this, there's a lot of judgment wrapped up in this, but often it might be fictional or a proxy that that you've created. Um, and this is this is a key idea in, in design thinking literature. There's a lot of work around designing personas. Companies use personas to to think about user groups. You know, I've heard the example of Einstein Bros Bagel thinking about their different customer groups, and they use persona so they can satiate the needs of different groups. Um, the heuristics just taking this, you know, across the frames of reference. Likewise, I mentioned some limitations already, right? Um, bias is, is really key, and group bias being a big one, right? The primary groups we might tend to define are those likely nearest to us. But I think the use of the heuristic is intentionally trying to stretch us beyond that, right? And giving some guidance around the frames of reference that we might consider. And in turn, just, you know, that's about the first bullet's about reasoning. Um, the second is about action, right? We might feel an impulse to act. We might feel distressed with others or, or not like us, right? And so I think both reasoning and action are tied up in this. Moreover, bias and errors can lead to inaccurate assessments of stakeholder perspectives and even worse, inappropriate responses. And I think this is the, one of the main limitations, right? I think. Um, Irrespective bias, like perspective taken alone may not be enough to promote behavior. So these these are wrapped up. It might be inaccurate, it might make an inaccurate reference, or it might not be enough to promote behavior. Um, but there might be something worse than having an inaccurate judgment, right? Um, and then doing something based on that inaccurate judgment. So the third bullet I think is really key, and this goes back to where we started. Like empathy, I don't think is interaction. It can motivate interaction. I think developing good understanding of stakeholder groups, like that itself also requires a lot of work. Um, finally, the human the heuristic itself is largely human centric. I think that's borrowed from Paro. I, you know, I've intentionally tried to get it beyond that, but I see there's like a human centric emphasis in thinking about our teams at the gate and ourselves. Um, Nonetheless, I, I do think there's some takeaways and starting from the top, empathy can promote ethical reasoning and motivate pro-social behavior. It's a complex multi-dimensional phenomenon. Uh, two competing dimensions offered were cognitive and affective empathy that hopefully makes it more accessible for others to enter the space of empathy and talk about it. I'm interested to hear what you say, uh, what you think. And then finally, I think that a heuristic, despite the limitations, can still help promote empathy with the stakeholders from the self to across the globe imperfect by itself, but still, I think, helpful towards that goal of helping engineers empathize and make ethical decisions in a global world. Okay, I, I think I'm a little over time, but thank you. Um, thank you all. Thanks, Justin, that was so fun. Um, it, it, people have been sending in questions the entire time, and I've been writing down my own questions the entire okay. time. Um, should, so, should I take this down, Jonathan? <laughs> um, so I can see. Yeah, sure. That's great, Justin, if you don't mind. And we can see each other. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, I've tried to organize these. Oh, one second. We've got uh, one more in the queue. 
Oh, yeah, good. Um, yeah, so we've got, I've seen sort of two buckets of questions, Justin, so I'm going to try to divide those up, and you can choose where you want to start. There's mm -hmm. the sort of conceptual bucket, so questions about the concept of empathy itself, and then the scope bucket. And these are questions about to whom and how far does it apply in what contexts. Mm -hmm. um, and my preference might be to start with the latter and back our way into the conceptual, but it's up to you if you want to start. Mm -hmm. Will you say a little more about the to whom, the heuristic itself or empathy or to whom does it apply? Yeah, I think it's like the scope of like to, to whom the concept applies, like when we're talking about it. We've got, so in that bucket, and I'll, I'll have people ask their questions, but we've got questions about non-human animals, about the impact of AI, about the individual versus collective, like empathy seems to apply in all these various ways slightly differently. And I think folks had a lot of questions mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then the conceptual bucket is about mm -hmm. the history of the concept and the nature of the concept and sort of the mm -hmm. conceptual. Yeah, let me see at bonus slides. Um, I was seeing if I had one for Mark Davis. So I didn't bring Mark Davis in here. I don't have it in my bonus slides. Um, Mark Davis is um, a social psychologist. Uh, and Aris knows, like we talk a lot about his work and I, I've seen it built on in a lot of different ways. Um, so there's two key contributions that I like to cite from Mark Davis. And maybe this is actually bleeding back. Maybe it's connecting to both questions actually. Okay. Um, the first argument is uh, for empathy is a multidimensional phenomenon. So I had the quadrants, right? The idea is those are distinctly measurable, right? So I can measure, I brought it to the to the dimension level, but going back to the concept or type level, right? Um, perspective taking is different from empathic concern. That one's pretty easy to see the difference. But more of even within perspective taking, like imagine what I would call imagine self perspective taking is distinct from imagine other perspective taking, right? So those are distinctly measurable. And they also might manifest differently among individuals. So someone can maybe have strong a strong tendency to become concerned for others, but not be have a strong tendency to consider others' perspectives. Conversely, they could have a strong tendency to become concerned for others. They often consider themselves in other shoes, but often don't consider others in their own shoes. Um, so there's a lot of instrumentation around empathy. And, and another person I like to cite is Baron Cohen, who has a book called The Science of Evil. And in that book, he set out to, well, he, he began, or part of the, the story is studying uh, sociopaths um, who are very good at understanding others' perspectives, but conversely do not, often, often do not exhibit empathic concern, right? And so just the idea is that these things are distinct. And I think just entering that terrain and trying to understand empathy itself is very muddy. They go together, though. They can go together, I should say that, but they don't always. Like for me, I think the types inform each other, but literally in some individuals, you know, I mentioned sociopaths, but like neurodiverse learners, right, in, in particular, like just may not be able to exhibit a, a select empathy type. And so as someone who teaches this and brings it into classes, um, one thing I often say is I, I don't think empathy is a communication, so we've separated that, but I do think empathy gets us certain outcomes but I don't think it's the only way to get those outcomes, right? You know, an ideal world, we could interact with every single person across the globe because interaction is going to lead to more accurate empathy, right? I, I think that's just intuitively true. But in terms of, you know, thinking about engineers interacting with everyone in the world, it's it's not possible, especially as we expand, expand to maybe other species. And Jonathan, you know this from our work on the Deepwater Horizon, Right, I, my, my perception, but share your own actually, because I've said this before, like I think students struggle to consider the perspective of a marine mammal. So during the Deepwater Horizon case, there was an oil spill. We asked students to consider this per perspective of different stakeholders, one being marine animals and reason they're from. M my perception is students struggled and even some resisted right doing that. And eventually we actually shifted to thinking of a marine biologist in the case, and that was more accessible bringing back the human centric. Yes. Yeah, so, so maybe Justin, maybe that's where I want to start. Cause you, you mentioned yeah. probably through the talk, you mentioned Franz DeWall's work and it just like randomly sitting on my desk here, I've got his last book, Mama's Last Hug. Okay. And if you, if you remember that case, um, if you don't know everybody, this, this mm -hmm. scenario, there was a, uh, a, there's a very famous video of a, a 
57 year old female chimpanzee at the end of her life um, and an elderly uh, a human researcher, a caretaker of hers from early in her life comes to visit her one last time. And she's not eating, she's not drinking, she's just lying down, she's, she's done, she's at the end of her life. And this researcher comes in and there's this moment of not recognition and then the connection where she recognizes this person she hasn't seen in 20 something years. Mm -hmm. And she reaches out and gives him a hug. And Dewal leans into this and argues that there is an empathetic connection. I don't know if he uses this language, Justin, but mm -hmm. I, my question for you is, is just like, where's that space between the pro-social behavior and the innocent bystander stuff that sort of mm -hmm. separates human empathy from non-human empathy and the Dewal mm -hmm. stuff that links it intimately? Like, mm -hmm. I, I want to know more of that. Like, I, I think you're exactly right. We've seen in our own thinking that our own research that students have a hard time making that connection but i want to know like is that a is that a possible connection should we be pushing them is that a thing we can do yeah it's hard very quickly right because i ask my values i teach an ethics class i start with values what are your values and we actually you know end with environmental ethics. we do a series of case studies and one of the last ones is is very concernedly focused on environmental ethics and i've had students say like you know human human life is worth more. Like I ask these questions, right? So there's a valuation of humans over animals. That's part of it. And I think part of the story with the marine mammals is like that we're, we're different species, right? But there's also empathy, I think, wrapped up in here. I think, so Dewall has work around this. Um, and I think it's useful to think about cognitive and affective empathy here as we think about humans and animals. Um, there's another cognitive empathy type called theory of mind. And that's the idea that you can infer what's going on in someone else's brain, maybe through their actions, right, or, or whatnot, but you can make an inference. And the question is, can animals do this? I think DeWall answers in the affirmative, but there's a lot of researches that just says, we're, we're fooling ourselves, right? We don't have enough empirical evidence to really support that claim. And I think DeWall argues against that. Um, so that I, I tie this with cognitive empathy. I, I bring it back to the dimension level. Can animals have cognitive empathy? Um, you know, I ask my students, uh, uh, does your dog understand your perspective? Like if they have a pet and some will say yes, some will say no. Um, I think that is part of the puzzle. Um, and, and in Roz Burns upcoming book chapter, I talk about animal ethics as often being excluded in engineering. And I think empathy is kind of wrapped up in it. And I actually float the question, are animals part of the environment or are they part of social? So if you think about sustainability, often it's tripartite, economic, social, environmental. I think there's been a lot of silence on that specific question. So when we're talking about environmental empathy, are we talking about empathy, or environmental sustainability, as that example, are we including animals there? Or are we including it in social? I think the takeaway I offer in, in, in that book chapter is, if we agree that animals have a cognitive empathy, then why would they not be in the social? It's kind of the question I folks. So maybe that's a heuristic to answer that very specific question. Yeah. But yeah. even in literature, right, there's not agreement. But but I'll just say I know I'm rant, like rambling. I think affective empathy is really much easier. I does your dog care about you? I, I feel like most people would say yes, pretty. So I think affective empathy in animals, it, more agreement there, and more answers in the affirmative. Cognitive empathy, maybe it's a little harder. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Kubler has uh, questions, mm -hmm. uh, several questions for you, but one specifically on on uh, about the potential role mm -hmm. of AI here in stimulating empathy. And Steve, if you want to go ahead, please do. Sure, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, I, I was wondering if you think uh, AI is, a, and especially mm -hmm. generative algorithms for producing pictures and video are potentially mm -hmm. powerful for uh, imbuing empathy, connecting back to your idea of helping neurodivergent individuals or sociopaths generate a sense of empathy. Um, and I, I qualify that. It sounds like an IRB nightmare, I have to say, to do that kind of work. But I, I'm, I think people do that already with avatars in various ways. Uh, I know in, in education, even chemical education, people use avatars to help develop uh, a sense of or to train people to learn to be better teachers, which to me is maybe cultivating some affect and they talk about affective response um so I, I wanted to throw that out there and yet i wonder if there's a limit because i also know that when people think about uh animation it's it's known that if the animation gets too close but doesn't quite look human like 
people reject it and feel distance. Uh, so there's a whole ton of thoughts to process. Yeah, I, I, I'm sad that I can't remember her name. Someone talked about this very question at Appy this year. She was from ASU. Um, so maybe I'll share the name after I find it. And it, it was more of an exploratory study. It wasn't giving answers, but it's asking that very question. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is with engineering students in particular, can we use AI to promote empathy? Um, I think the question, I mean, AI, there's so much interest in AI right now. And I think one of the biggest challenges with AI is all the biases that are folded into the you know, the data set, the large language model is built on data. And then, you know, in terms of the responses AI gets it, you know, maybe you've seen, you know, the, the, you know, the depictions of presidents as, you know, non-white, you know, men, you know, from different cultures, you know, in the history of the U.S., right, we, we've had one non-white male president, right? So, there, there's a lot of examples like that where like the accuracy of the output is, is kind of questionable. So like there's a danger that, that kind of aligns with this idea of trying to empathize with someone, you know, across the world, imagine that you've never experienced that you've never seen, right? There could be a lot of inaccuracy folded into that too. And there's danger about making decisions with, you know, inaccurate information. Um, that, that's a limitation of the model and then a potential limitation with AI. And I, I mean, there's so many directions I could take that question. I, I don't know, Stephen, would that satiate your, your inquiry, other responses based on that? Um, you know, I, I, was, I understand your um, point about all of the different biases folded in. And I was even thinking, you know, could you have a, a generative AI that's trained on a controlled data set? Part of that would be mm -hmm. the image of the individual in whom you're trying yeah. to generate an empathic feeling. And so, mm -hmm. you know, would it be more powerful or different or maybe even not effective to have that individual seeing themselves undergoing an experience of joy or harm? And that's why I said it sounds like an IRB nightmare. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, th that would be different from them observing someone who doesn't look like them uh, yeah. going through that experience. And, you know, all of that cuts across gender and race and all those kinds of things. But with AI, you could bring it right to the person. You don't have to imagine them in the shoes. You put them viewing themselves in the shoes. And, you know, what, is, what, is that, what does that do to empathy? Mm -hmm. Stephen, Justin, uh, Camille just posted in the, in the chat to me. I'll share the link with everybody, a link to a 2023 Nature article on this question. Okay. Oh, cool. Finding beliefs about AI and its role in per perceived role in ah, thank you. empathy and effectiveness. Neat. Thank you. That's awesome. I don't know this article. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, I, Steve, if it's okay, I want to stick with you because we have one more question in the sort of the scope bucket, Justin. This one, um, I was thinking about too, as you were talking, you you mentioned, and I didn't quite catch the citation, but the concept of social empathy. And mm -hmm. that got me thinking about the tension between like individual empathy and collective empathy. And then Steve, you asked a really parallel question about empathy in the profession. I didn't know if you want to jump on that next. Mm -hmm. Sure, I can try to articulate it. Um, I think you might address it and say, well, that's what I mean by the difference between uh, effective empathy and cognitive empathy. But you laid out a slide where you made a distinction between, I think, microethics and macroethics, and maybe the ethics of the profession lives in the macro. And uh, mm -hmm. our team, and maybe myself, I've been self-obsessed with the notion of, you know, what, is, what does ethics look like for the individual versus the profession? Is the profession and its ethics just an average of the ethics of the individual stakeholders mm -hmm. who are part of that profession and you know how does it shape back and forth but you now raise the question of where does empathy fit into that and so i can i can i can process the idea of empathy for the individual but i don't know if it's even meaningful to talk about empathy of the profession um mm. is is the ability if empathy informs ethics and if a profession only experiences empathy through its individuals, which makes more sense. Does that mean professional ethics is fundamentally more limited and maybe disconnected from human experience uh, fundamentally mm -hmm. because it can't experience empathy? Um, mm -hmm. So that's there. But then I'm also thinking, oh, well, we talk about complex systems and complex systems can exhibit behaviors that are very different from the individual. Maybe in that sense, the profession is a complex system that has a different notion of of response mm -hmm. self-preservation and in that is maybe a form of mm -hmm. empathy anyway random thoughts play with it 
Yeah, I mean, I uh, I did not go in detail on ethics, engineering ethics, the history, or nor the history of empathy, but um, engineering is a profession. What does that mean, right? And and Joe Herker has a lot of work in this space. Um, and why is it a profession? Why did we want to be a profession, right? I, I think all of that, like maybe there's some self-interest and some self-serving. I think I heard that, uh, Stephen. Yes. But also now there's norms, right? There's ethics codes. Those are normative. Engineering ethics is, is kind of expected. It's it's within the discipline. Um, and it's slow to change. Um, as engineering emerged as a profession, a lot of those codes emphasized loyalty to the employer, right? Um, so that's that's our starting point. You know, in more recent years, that's that's very le very much less common. It's still in there though, right? Um, there's a bunch of ethical foundations, loyalty being one of them. We haven't talked about Jonathan Haidt, but right. Um, you know, that spans to today where I think there's an increasing focus on, on macroethics in the form of thinking about social impacts of our work. And I think, you know, the group, the group dynamic is really hard. And that's why I like to show that graphic, which was largely motivated through my work with Aris. So thank you again, being here, Aris. And in Aris's dissertation, I almost want to invite Aris to jump in. I kept asking questions like, how do you measure this? Like, what is it like the average? Is it, you know, because part of my goal is, is, is to bring this stuff in the curriculum to help instructors assess it with numbers because engineers like numbers because then they can respond to numbers. And gosh, that is really, really hard. Um, I don't know. Feel free to jump in, Aris, but uh, Aris is doing great work. Happy to do. Aris, maybe share your recent journal article. My JE too, maybe. Yeah, thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Justin. You always, <laughs> you know, make uh make it uh, as a uh, thing beyond, and uh, the way I think always is uh, mm -hmm. making new connections. So, the animal mm -hmm. talk and the th having this mm -hmm. kind of thinking helped me also to, you know, <clears throat> to push in the idea on the cognitive mm -hmm. side. So you were talking about. Mm, people that might not exhibit empathy, right? And mm -hmm. uh, from my perspective, always, as you were saying also, is self and then others. Mm -hmm. Sounds like mm -hmm. if we are able to help them think, you know, because mm -hmm. sometimes we don't empathize because we don't know, we have not experienced something mm -hmm. and it's really difficult for us. So I'm guessing that uh, through cognitive side, we are able to tap on the affective side and that would be creating that mm -hmm. um, behavior response. So mm -hmm. um, that is how I see it uh, mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, the difficulty sometimes is because we don't know. Mm -hmm. So asking questions, mm -hmm. so connecting with your, what you said. So empathy mm -hmm. and interactions are mm -hmm. not connected, if I understood Justin. But mm -hmm. to me, the way I see it is if you want to empathize and you don't know how, you need to interact to gather that mm -hmm. information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Aris, maybe a little more on the, the proxy idea, right? And, and so Elizabeth Sanders recently graduated here too, and, and she studied user interactions. But like sometimes there might be stakeholders we just can't access for whatever reason. And proxies in that sense, you know, may be the source for interaction for understanding another user, right? So, I mean, that's a whole other angle and it maybe connects back to the animals and the marine biologists versus marine mammals, right? Because you can actually talk to a marine, uh, maybe, right, a uh, biologist. Just, I want to I push now mm -hmm. to the sort of conceptual side. We've got uh, kind of three little buckets of questions, one from Alex, mm -hmm. uh, one from Josh, and then one on the history from, from me and leaning on uh, Dr. Park, who I want to introduce you to in just mm -hmm. a couple of minutes. But let's start with, with Alex uh, Nicolaitis first. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Justin. This has been a, yeah. a wonderful presentation. Thanks, with I have literally dozens of questions, uh, but I'll focus on one for the time being. Hopefully, we get mm -hmm. to talk more about some of these ideas, which I think are are wonderful. Um, so my uh, question is more about the fundamentals of you know mm -hmm. starting to to begin and think about an education for an ethics education for empathy for engineers as something that. Mm -hmm make sense. And so here I'm kind of finding the point that I want to enter here in your conversation about the causation, right? And thinking about mm -hmm. um, about how engineers tend to think about their work as, well, 
tend to think about cause and effect more generally. And then they have perhaps mm -hmm. a problem they want to solve. They want to make something that mm -hmm. does that and so on and so forth. And in many ways, you know, um, instead of just thinking about technical issues, we also want to make them think about broader social issues and impact more broadly, not mm -hmm. just what I'm doing. But I do see a, a slight tension here because I, I think there's two different ways of thinking about causation. And one is, you know, natural uh, like causes of what happens, which are mm -hmm. so yeah. complex that at the end of the day, they don't really they're not necessarily very informative unless you're in a lab doing specific mm -hmm. experiments, isolating things of that sort. And then you have political forms of causation, right? Mm -hmm. And there's uh, scholars like Deborah Stone, for instance, who talks about causal stories and policy and how um, basically what, what causation involves is people picking their boogeyman and who they want to blame about something and saying that caused that, right? Um, so it's not very easy to distinguish what causes a bad outcome, especially because all of these factors come in. Um, and I can see, you know, the very classic thing that you hear from engineers and engineering students, it's not my business to, to think of that thing. Uh, and in some sense, they might be right. Maybe um, it's insufficient to draw a causal mechanism between their work and the bad outcomes that come from it and maybe you know the blaming of engineers is so we deflect um responsibility from political actors who have impacted the profession in ways and then you know expanding the scope of what an engineer has to think maybe makes it too much to even start thinking about what the role of an engineer is mm -hmm. in the world and maybe there are limits to you know to what extent should engineers be thinking about social problems and downstream mm -hmm. consequences and applicability of their technologies mm -hmm. and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how do you, if you can say a bit more, first of all, about how you think about causation, but also how would you go about resolving this issue, right? Because um, I think there's a delicate balance between mm -hmm. telling engineers, you know, there are ways in mm -hmm. which what you're doing and you know, your agency as an engineer and as a profession does impact things. Uh, but at the end of the day, when it comes to, you know, reasonably unforeseeable consequences, um, do we need to start sweating about those just because there are malicious actors that are using these things? Or is that counterproductive in some ways? Um, mm -hmm. is, is there a way to distinguish between the work that engineers do and find, you know, some other um safeguards or yeah I, I guess you know ways to safeguard um the work of engineers from potentially bad consequences that are happening out there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i have i have multiple lines of flight i want to use that delusian turn term um I mean, the, the, the main word that's coming to my mind is like the culture, the culture of engineering, right? Um, there's a really popular study by Aaron Stack from 2014 that discusses uh, the culture of disengagement in engineering. And right, there's beliefs that engineering's meritocratic, right? And that socio-technical can be divided, right? Um, and, and the main point in this 2014 work, there's uh, an empirical investigation of four university sites. And the finding is that across four years of academic training, um, they become more disengaged with concerns for public welfare, right? And the argument is that there's a academic culture of disengagement in engineering programs that lead actually to students. We're training students, right, to not care about those. Um, I will say Brent Jessick, um, Carlos Zoltowski and team ha have a recent series of papers and they push back against that. There's a recent science and engineering ethics paper um, that just suggests that like there's not gains. I, here, I'm working from my memory. There's not as significant declines as found in SEC. So there's a nine year window between the studies. Great. So maybe it's not as dire now or, or at the universities at least that they studied. Um, you know, I've done some work on what I call the engineering worldview. And like, these are the beliefs of engineering, what it means to be an engineer. And I think one of those core beliefs is, going back to cognition, is, is mechanistic in nature. It's just the idea that we, we can think about things as a system, we can draw boundaries around them, and then control things within that system, right? 
that's a belief that engineers have, and that's trained, right? That's trained into them through their academic programs. Um, another, I think, that is maybe detrimental is like this belief that if there are problems, we can solve them. For every problem, there is a solution, right? And progress is another one, right? The idea is like as problems become more complex, we, we will it's a faith in the idea that we can solve them through progress. So all these things are kind of wrapped up in this idea of it's still a tie to causation. And I, I don't know, I think it's it's aligned with this technical focus versus the social. But on the other hand, people are like, you cannot, if your goal is to engineer for folks to, to meet their needs, for example, go back to design, right? If you're trying to meet user needs, how can you do that without understanding the users? Well, very quickly right now, this is a social phenomenon, right? That's really the starting point. So that, like this just connects to my point where empathize is off, empathy is often studied in design. The first step is empathize, which I personally crit critique, right? The idea might be interpreted as, okay, we can empathize. Now we can detach and go away and design because we've empathized, right? Um, I don't know. Does that answer your questions? I feel like I went, I had five directions in my yeah, mind. No, 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 that's try. helpful. If I, <laughs> if I can just uh, say uh, what I think you, yeah, you responded, yeah, yeah. Uh, just so you can confirm. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So I understand basically what you're saying is that this uh, idea of causation really comes into play when we think about um, like the input of what happens, right? And oh, thinking absolutely. about the social thinking about, mm -hmm. okay, what do we want to do? Uh, mm -hmm. And we can do it this way. But then on the back end, when we're thinking about output or unforeseen consequences, because, you know, maybe mm -hmm. research on a drug can be used to create a bioweapon or whatever, that doesn't necessarily need, we need to assign responsibility and hold engineers accountable because that's where the political comes in. So that's Kind of how I understood yeah. your response. Um, and, and, and engineers, right? If my job's defining the boundary or working within the boundary, which has inputs and outputs, so there's boundary work, right? You can identify cause and effects within this system now that you've developed, you've painted. Um, so yeah, and I'll share a, a really sad story. So in my ethics class, I have them do capstone projects. Um, I've toned it down to campus issues because three years ago, they focused on really large macro ethical issues where they couldn't engage with anyone. I wanted them to engage stakeholders, like literally go talk with someone. Um, but one group focused on arms distribution in the Middle East. And they took different perspectives to interrogate the case. And one was a manufacturing engineer. And he, he couldn't talk, he didn't, wasn't able to talk with anyone, but he synthesized Reddit posts. And so his inference was that manufacturing engineers would not care about where the arms get distributed. They would just do their job. I thought that was really sad. And so part of my quest and some people's quest is to get people to really question those. Uh, I'll cite Graham Four, one of my colleagues. It's about lines, right? Where's your line? Where will you not accept right doing certain work? And that's that's kind of my goal in my ethics course. What are your values? What will you not give on? You know, what are your profession values too? You know, maybe they're in alignment. Maybe they're distinct. Um, it's it's a really sad story um, because that was 16 weeks into a semester. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that goes back to the culture idea. It's kind of programmed into students to think in very mechanistic ways that emphasize technical systems. Dr. Hess, not to end on a on a sad story note, but yeah. I, I realize we're short on time. We have we have at least two more questions. But I think what I'd like to do is turn things back over to Dr. Kubler to close us out. And then if you are willing, we can stick around for a few more questions afterwards. I'll make, I'll make the story a little less sad. I, the okay. student was really struggling, right? I could sense it. Like I could empathize with them, but that's really what they thought a manufacturing engineer would do. They would just do their job. The, the fact that they were struggling showed this openness to like the uncomfortability with that. Um, that's, that's still sad, judgment. but not quite as depressing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Thanks. Dr. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Hess, for helping us understand the interplay between empathy and ethics and engineering. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Beaver also for moderating our discussion. And thank you, our participants, for great questions and great engagement. And a recording of this presentation will be made available on the UCF Center for Ethics website, so you can view it again and share it with others. And there you can find links to past talks and information on upcoming presentations and ethically speaking. In the summer, we're going to plan out new talks for our series and send you information on those in early fall. 
So if you have some ideas, send them to us. Ethically Speaking is made possible with support from the National Science Foundation and many other UCF partners that you see listed here. I'd like to thank them all for bringing this seri series to you. And once again, thank you for your participation. And we hope to see you all in future presentations in Ethically Speaking.